Greetings, class. Uh, my name is Paul Kroon. I teach English 101 and 102 at Seattle Central College. And today I'm going to outline and go over the five section essay pattern. Um, and the topic I'm going, we're going to address is abolish the death penalty. So this pattern it, it is five distinct parts. Now, you're familiar with the five paragraph essay, I assume. Introduction, three bodies of support, and, con and conclusion. That also has five sections. But this pattern is not that. So uh, this is a higher level pattern. It still helps you organize, and it's, the whole focus is using sources to support your uh, analysis and your argument. So right here, I'm just going to go over the five parts. Number one, you engage the reader. Number two, state the position. Number three, argue directly for the position. Number four, count, counter argue. Number five, call to action. So, and I'll, I'll cover uh, how you support each section, but first let's go back over to your familiar pro-con list. Now, this pattern works effectively anytime you have a controversial issue where reasonable people can stand on either side. For example, we have boss the death penalty, should we legalize uh, marijuana use, uh, abolish or keep abortions, uh, gun control, uh, legalize aiding and dying, on and on and on. Should we have a dog park in our community? So when you have two sides of any issue, it's controversial, uh, this pattern works effectively for th uh, those types of topics. Now, what I have over here is a pro-con list. Pro means for, con against. So the question is, should we abolish the death penalty? So first, I'm going to go ahead and go over the pro-con list, but you can do this on your own for any controversial issue. Just do the T-bar and uh, go ahead and go for it. Now, of course, there's more than uh, four reasons to abolish the death penalty, and there's more than uh, five reasons to keep uh, the death penalty. But I'm going over the strongest ones, uh, the ones most people would use, and the ones that have the most sources. Because it's all about helping you organize and use sources effectively. And uh, so here, to abolish the death penalty, we have racial bias, cruel and unusual, eyewitness error, and DNA exonerations. You notice here I put a plus sign. Because typically, uh, most eyewitness misidentifications or errors are resolved because of DNA exoneration. So those two kind of work together, but you can keep them separate as well. Um, because DNA exoneration is now 99.9% uh, accurate, and it, it's, they were starting to use that in the mid-80s. And, and of course, everything we're, we're doing is looking at the United States, uh, and it helps to keep everything focused for the students and for the, uh, the class. Now, reasons. To keep the death penalty, we have deterrence, brings justice, and usually this brings justice is an uh, eye for an eye. Uh, you know, it's only equal. It's a sense of uh, equal uh, treatment. Saves money, brings closure. Typically, you say brings closure to the victim's family so they can heal or resolve uh, their trauma, or you can say it brings closure to society. But so typically brings closure uh, is not the same, of course, as brings justice. Just brings justice, this argument uh, states that um, the death penalty is you, know, you kill somebody, you should be killed, a type of eye for an eye. Or constitutional. And typically uh, attorney generals or governors that, because uh, uh, sta some states, of course, still have the death penalty, they typically cite the Tenth Amendment of the Bill of Rights um, which they, they argue uh, it's states' rights. It's up to the state to decide uh, what to do in, in their jurisdiction. Okay, so that's constitutional. So again, you have a controversial issue, and then you do a pro-con list. So once you've done this, and you start to see already, these terms are usually maybe one word, two words. They're very 
succinct and short because also when, once you do your pro con list, these uh, items or these, the listing works as keyword searches. So you can actually have nice keyword searches for any of these issues. So all you have to do, for example, if you want to find a source uh, for cruel and unusual, you type in cruel uh, death penalty, unusual death penalty, eyewitness error death penalty, and then all of a sudden you get a plethora of sources. So these function also as keyword searches, but also you'll see they, they function as subtitles. And I'll show you how that works in a second. Okay, so we've done the pro-con list. And most instructors uh, will have this already shaped up, but you can do this on your own. For example, in my classes, I already, I've already uh, curated and vetted the um, strongest reasons for and against. Okay. So now let's come back over here to the five section essay. Each one of these sections are distinct and uh, they, they logically flow, one, flow from one, two, three, four, five. So put them in this order. For example, if you want to you write your essay, you can put the counter argument first, but it makes sense to follow this pattern. Why? Because this pattern has velocity, okay? It's logical. So you go one, two, three, four, five, boom, you're done. Now, of course, as you write your essay, you can move around and you don't have to start with one and then work your way through. For example, you can do the counter argument first. Uh, you can do the call to action. You know, so you can move around, but typically you'll start, as you do your research, you'll start in this pattern because it builds velocity and it's logical. Okay, and we all like logic. So, in essence, this is the heart of your uh, position argument. Now, what it does too is it develops critical thinking because now you're looking at two sides of an issue. Okay, that's a, a hallmark of critical thinking. All right, so let's go ahead and, and focus more on these, how you fill in the sections. Okay, excuse me here. All right. I don't think I need, I don't think I need to spit on that. All right. So give me some room here. So now the heart of your essay will be here. Our, uh, this is where you spend most of your time and energy, okay, for this particular uh, pattern, okay? So first, engage the reader. All you want to do is tell one short story or illustration. Now, you want to find a story that will pre-frame and engage the reader. So, uh, for example, uh, this is sometimes you have to kind of play around the story. If I'm going to argue to abolish the death penalty, which is my position, let's just put this here, abolish death penalty, I go f back to my pro-con list, and depending on my class, uh, how, how many pages do I need to produce? Uh, for example, I just have you produce approximately five pages of body. But this pattern could easily function as a 20, 25 page essay, no problem. But say, I'm, okay, I'm looking at five pages, so I'm not going to use each one of these four reasons. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. So I'm going to pick two. So say if I'm going to pick racial bias and cruel and unusual. Okay, so I find a story that will pre-frame either racial bias or cruel and unusual. It doesn't have to be both. So my story I'm going to tell, for example, I may use Anthony Ray Hinton who spent 30 years on um, death row and finally exonerated through eyewitness error. Okay, so, but I'm not using eyewitness error, but I am using cruel and unusual. So 30 years on death row is a form of uh, uh, cruelty because uh, the person knows they're going to die and then it's cruel because solitary confinement is um, you're isolated for 23 and a half hours per day. You're in, you're in a little 10 by 10 room. You might have a black and white TV, 
writing utensils. But for 30 minutes a day, you're shackled and hobbled to a chain link area where you can just move around. And that's 30 minutes a day. You, can't, you don't associate. You're not in general population or general pop. So that's a form of cruelty. And of course, I would use later, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I'll use the Eighth Amendment of the Bill of Rights to support this cruel. So I can use Hinton's story because I know I'm going to focus on cruel and unusual. Also, Hinton was, uh, is African American. So if I'm going to, I can use Hinton if I'm going to look at racial bias. Does that make sense? It could, if I'm going to look at racial bias, I can look at Latino, Pacific Islander, Native American, Indigenous people, African American, because they're overrepresented on death row and uh, in the prison system. So I find a story that will engage the reader and pre-frame my argument. Does that make sense? So I, just, I, don't, I do not lecture, I do not preach, I do not respond, I do not use first person and say, this is how I feel, this is this terrible. All I do is simply tell the story with the key points. I don't spend too much time. This will probably be 100 words or maybe uh, uh, 10 lines at the most. And then I'll include one startling statistic, one stat. In this case, I might put a statistic of how many people in the United States are on death row at any one time. So I'll include that statistic, because then that's, I'm going to focus on the cruelty of being on death row in solitary confinement. Okay, so one statistic, that's it. One story, one statistic, I've engaged the reader. All right, now we're going to move on to the next part. Okay, so this one, abolish the death penalty, is very simple. It's just one declarative statement. And that goes at the end of your opening, engage the reader. So it's usually uh, pre uh, uh, prefaced by a semicolon. So you, you tell the story, Anthony Ray Hinton, whoever I use, tell the story, I'm done, semicolon, then I, and I put abolish the death penalty. That's it. As simple as that. I don't forecast. I don't introduce in the opening. Uh, listen, if you're going to do a PowerPoint, OK, maybe you can do an introduction or forecast. But for this paper, uh, to be, keep the velocity, why do you want to repeat? Why do you want to forecast and use introduction? Do not do that, please. OK, for this pattern, it, just, it slows it down. OK, now, you see already I finished one and I finished two. Now, here we go, argue directly. So now what I do. I've got my four reasons, but say I'm going to just choose racial bias and cruel and unusual, like I said. But I can choose any two. So what I do here is and I open up my Word file. I type in racial bias, and that's going to be my bolded subtitle. And I'm going to justify it left. And then now I look for sources. So all the sources I look for for racial bias uh, see, I, it helps me stay focused. So I don't, I, don't, I don't get distracted by DNA exoneration, eyewitness error, cruel and unusual. So I go through my source list. Hopefully your instructor, uh, in case I have provided a source list, extensive source list. So I look, and I'll look just for racial bias. And then I'll find those sources, and I'll put them under that bolded subtitle. Now, for paragraph unity, I keep it. I have one source per paragraph. So that keeps my uh, paragraph unified. So I'll use a clear signal phrase, according to the Death Penalty Information Center. The death penalty is racially biased because, and then I'll, that's my source. So then I either paraphrase, which is uh, put in my own words, without borrowing too much of the original uh, language, because then that's plagiarism. This is uh, a most difficult skill to learn, but it's most effective. It gives you the most control. Or I'll quote. I'll use integrated quote or in-text citation. Again, I can use uh, key phrases, or I can use the entire sentence. But again, I have to be careful, because typically that quote is going to be in passive voice, and they may have a different agenda. So I have to be careful, make sure that quote says exactly what I wanted to say. Or I can use a block quote or a, a long quote. And that is, um, there's only three ways to use the source. Paraphrase, which gives you the most control, but is the most 
uh, challenging and difficult to learn. It just takes skill and practice. You have to practice and study, but you will, uh, you will be able to paraphrase. And then once you read more of a material, you'll be very uh, effective at paraphrasing. And then integrated quote. And again, you can, in one paragraph, you can paraphrase and have in-text citation together from the same source. Or a block quote, typically the standard is use four lines or more of material, then you put in a block quote. And that's indented 10 spaces, no quotation marks, uh, followed by a clear introductory sentence. Uh, the, death, uh, the Death Penalty Information Center cl uh, claims the following colon, then the block quote. Okay, so those are only three ways to use a source. That's it. Now what we're talking about is the MLA citation system. Okay, here, let me get rid of this so you can see my, see my face. And the Modern Language Association system, or MLA, is a very common citation system. Uh, but also the Chicago Manuscript Style System, or CMS, they also require signal phrases and uh, boundary markers. So CMS and MLA are very similar in how they use sources. So again, you paraphrase, uh, integrated quote, or block quote. Same for MLA in Chicago. Okay, so um, once I finish uh, citing my sources, I'm done with racial bias, I go to cruel and unusual. Then I do another bolded subtitle, cruel and unusual. In this case, I'll bold it. Uh, I don't have to capitalize all the words, just the, um, the, just the, the beginning, uh, opening letter. And then I look only for cruel and unusual sources. So again, I'll use the Eighth Amendment. I'll, uh, I'll use the keyword search, uh, cruel, I mean, death penalty, solitary confinement. Oh, according to American Civil Liberties Union, solitary co confinement is cruel, then there we go. Now, cruel is different from unusual. Uh, typically, you can say the cruelty part is uh, you, you tell somebody you're going to kill them, they're going to die soon, so that's a form of mental torture. Solitary confinement, we've already covered that, that's a form of cruelty. Unusual is a, is a sense that it's unusual for the state to kill its own citizens. You see, that's what's unusual. It's unusual for a progressive democratic nation to have the death penalty. That's unusual. So, so do not combine the two because even though you say cruel and unusual in the Eighth Amendment, uh, the Bill of Rights, they're not the same. So you have to parse them apart, but they all go under cruel and unusual. Okay? So, and basically, I just keep working on it. Then I'm done with number three. We'll come back to this, but number four, the counter-argument. Now what I do, I go back to my pro-con list, and I find one objection that I plan to counter. So let's just take deterrence. So I go back and open up my Word file. So I type in deterrence, bolded subtitle, bolded, justified left, and I simply add a question mark. Why do I add a question mark to that bolded subtitle? Because that demarcates that this is a counterargument section. And you can actually see how your voice might uh, rise. Deterrence, you know, so it kind of functions that way. But this is not, see, so the, you don't respond to it as a question because you don't use questions anywhere in this essay except in the last section which is okay to use rhetorical questions. Okay? That's okay, but nowhere else are you, it, it's not a, you don't ask a question, because you've already asked the question. Hey, should we abolish the death penalty? You've already asked that question. So you don't ask it, you just say yes or no. So here we're looking at abolish it, okay? So now deterrence, the first paragraph, you use a source, a signal phrase, according to, and you find a source, according to attorney uh, uh, DeSanctis, the death penalty deters capital crimes because uh, people who are thinking about committing a capital crime, first degree murder, uh, et cetera, they are, are afraid of the death penalty so they'll pause or they won't commit the crime. You see, that's the argument for deterrence, okay, typically. 
The second paragraph, you're going to counter. Now, this is important to pay attention to. You do not use a reason from your pro-con list to counter, because these do not communicate with each other. I hope that makes sense. There's no communication. You have to directly counter deterrence. So you will find a source that says, well, according to attorney uh, Norm Pattis, the death penalty doesn't deter because most people have some mental illness, substance abuse, uh, or serial killers have no, uh, their sociopath, psychopath, they, they're not deterred uh, at all. In fact, some serial killers believe they can, they're smarter than the police. So you, know. so, so you start, and you can use statistics in either case that the death penalty does not deter. That's it. Two paragraphs, you're done. Now, let's come back to the bolded subtitle. Why do we use bolded subtitles? Um, help you organize. That's why. If you, if you go to a, a class and the instructor does not want you to use bolded subtitles, you say, no problem. As you keyboard your essay, when you're ready to turn it into that class, that instructor, you simply remove the bolded subtitles. You'll still have the great organization. You'll still have, uh, it's going to be organized but you just remove the, the bolded subtitles. Now, I will say this in the defense of the bolded subtitles. Uh, MLA, if you look at MLA, the new edition, the example model paper they have, they use subtitles. They call them, they use italics. They don't use bolded. They use subtitles. <laughs> they just started doing that in the last couple of years. I've been using this for over 20 Okay, so I'm not saying they copied me, but anyways. So now the Modern Language Association, their model exemplary essay uses subtitles. They, 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 um, they call them subheadings. Okay, so that's all I'm saying. But if your instructor doesn't want you to use subtitles, take them out before you submit your final essay. Okay, so one, engage the reader. Two, state the position. Three, argue directly. Four, counter-argue, and then let's look at the last part, call to action. Now, in this uh, call to action, two bolded subtitles work very effectively. Do not put call to action as your bolded subtitle. In fact, you never point to the structure. Do not use the structural terms. Do not say, hey, I'm going to counter-argue here, or hey, I'm arguing directly, uh, oh, here's my position. No, or here I'm going to engage the reader. Come on, that's just for your purposes, for you to control. You do not use the structural terms in the essay. So here, I'm going to use, I'll give you two good ones. Looking forward, not move on, moving forward, <laughs> looking forward. But a better one I like is where do we go from here? Now you notice here, you do not put a question mark after this. It just, that's the subtitle. Where do we go from here? And if you watch uh, any um, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, or whoever, when they're interviewing somebody, at the end they always ask the person, well, where do we go from here? So it's a logical statement, and that's where I picked it up from. I heard over and over again people saying, where do we go from here at the end of their interview? So where do we go from here? So now you do the call to action. For this one, this is how you, you do it. I call it bookending. You come back to the story you used. I use Hinton, whoever I use, I come back to it. But I don't just simply repeat the story. No, because why? That's, uh, I've already said it. So I make a shared value or common ground appeal based on Hinton's story. So what I'm trying to do is develop some what? You've got it, empathy, okay? So I'll say, hey, it's, an, it's, it's a good thing we didn't execute an innocent person. Uh, I'm, we, we should feel saddened uh, that we put an innocent person on death row for 30 years, but at least we didn't execute. At least we don't have blood on our hands. So you're using the third person and use the second person. Never use the first person. So Hinton, uh, I'm glad now that Hinton has some freedom, but let's make sure we don't do this to any other innocent people. Um, 
And you can also throw in, hey, why don't we just do uh, life, with par or life without parole instead of the death penalty? So that would be a call to action. You can use the source for that, LWP. Hey, just, just, just get rid of the death penalty and just give the most serious crimes uh, life without parole. Okay, at least we're not going to find the uh, blood on our hands, on our hands. So you do, you're doing we. And here you can use rhetorical questions like, well, uh, what if that was you? <laughs> you know. And if you want, you can throw in another statistic in your call to action to look at the exonerations. If you're not using the DNA exoneration here uh, for your number three, you can throw it in the call to action. You can go ahead and say, uh, since... Uh, uh, DNA has been used since the uh, mid-80s. We've exonerated, I think, uh, according to the Innocence Project, we've exonerated uh, 350. Let's see, Innocence Project. Over 350 exonerated through DNA. Now, these are people uh, on death row or given a death sentence. Or, you know, so, so we've exonerated. So, the likelihood that we've killed innocent uh, people is very uh, 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 prominent. Okay, so I know this is quite a lot, but again, this is again a way to help you organize, uh, and it comes from a good pro-con list. All right, now I'll just end this uh, presentation with uh, one more on how to use um, what, what, generate, what do you use for your works cited essay? I mean, works cited page. Now, many students, they go to uh, uh, Google Bib, Noodle Bib, but I like, uh, I like to use Purdue University. Uh, they have a works cited um, uh, MLA source generator. Uh, you can go to their uh, handbook, it's the Owl at Purdue, quite nice. I like that for an online handbook because I don't require my classes to buy the best handbook, which I feel is the hacker, the hacker handbook. For your own purposes, if you want to have a nice handbook by your laptop or your desktop, go ahead and buy an older edition. Don't buy the brand new ones. They're over $100. Uh, buy like, uh, uh, you know, one, go on Amazon or whatever, buy one for 25 bucks or so. But in any case, to generate your works cited, your, your Chicago references, APA, American Psychological Association, any kind of uh, citation system, go try, check out the Purdue uh, source generator because that'll help you generate your works cited page. Okay, everybody, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Best of luck to you on your educational journey. And I'm sure you'll be a nice part of the, crit the critical discourse community uh, in your community and in the world. Thank you so much.